Welcome to the 1871 podcast and our very special guest tonight is Reading FC legend Steve Koppel. So a very warm welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks for joining us. No, thank you, Mark. Good to be here. And uh, yeah, thanks ever so much for coming back. You're on series, uh, series one very early on, uh, so appreciate you coming back. Um, and of course, Steve, you'll be forever remembered as the man responsible, not just for taking Reading up to the Premier League for the first time, but also for that incredible season and, of course, the 106 points record. So my first question really is, how are you feeling about Burnley at the moment? Uh, concerned and worried, I must admit. Um, I, I am keeping my fingers crossed. That I don't wish ill on any other manager, but in this particular circumstance, uh, very much aware that they are closing in and they look to be at the moment a very, very good side. Now, by way of some kind of uh, detraction from what they are doing, I would say that it's probably uh, parachute payment induced, whereas we could say that we were very much not parachute payment induced. We were doing a off our own bat and a very, very generous chairman at the time who obviously helped but uh, not to the extent that that Burnley, the, the aid they have had since being relegated. So on a level playing field, I, I still think we're, we're ahead. All right. And I've, I've got a couple more questions for you, Steve. And then I want to bring Dylan, uh, Dylan in uh, and, and Johnny as well. And, and Dylan especially because Dylan will tell you himself, but you are one of his heroes being a Man United fan. So I know he's really keen to chat to you. But... I wanted to ask you, obviously, last time we talked to you about your time at Reading, but I wanted to ask you when you, you first started thinking about becoming a manager, you know, was that during your playing days or was that when your career was coming to an end? When when did that thought process start for you, Steve? Well, to, to give you the full story, and it was a story, um, um, playing for United, I was obviously having a ball. It was... Uh, a great thing for me. And you've got to bear in mind that, you know, a few years, well, I started university when I was 18, 19. And it was, I got transferred halfway through university. It was my second year at university, I got transferred. In my first year, I played for Tranmere as an amateur. Uh, for some unknown reason, I wanted to play in the Football League as an amateur. And I certainly wasn't wealthy. Uh, depending on a student grant, you're not wealthy. Um, and then my second year university, I signed a £10 a week contract. So, you know, for me to then contemplate uh, playing football professionally um, was just a huge deal for me. Uh, to get the opportunity, Tommy Doherty uh, gave me the opportunity to play for United. He wanted me to finish my university career, which I'm forever in his debt, you know, I always say Tommy Doherty had as big an influence on my life, you know, second only to my father because of that one thing, saying finish your uni university career. So I did my university career, um, my three years, got my economics degree, I then started playing football professionally and I hold the record for United, which I don't think will ever be beaten now of the most number of consecutive games. I think I played over 200 and odd games without missing a match, which with rotation and squad sizes now, I don't think will ever be beaten. So I always just thought of my career as being next game, try and win it. You know, it was very, very limited. I had limited ambitions as such. I just wanted to stay in the team for as long as I could. And it was only when I got injured... And I think any player who has to retire with an injury will tell you that you you sense it very early on. You know something's not right. You know you're not going to be what you have been, what you were as such. So then you start looking forward. Now, prior to me being a, a footballer, uh, I had planned to become a teacher. I wanted to teach economics. I was hoping to do a, a postgraduate PE course so I could teach economics and PE. And then after playing football for United for a number of years, 
Um, you know, everything was going great. I was playing for England. We, we weren't massively successful, but it was still a hell of a ride for, you know, a young man. It was, it was terrific. And then when I got injured, all of a sudden, the spectre of retirement was sort of looming large towards me. And I was thinking then, well, I couldn't really see myself becoming a teacher then. At 27, 28 years of age, 28 when I retired, I thought, you know, having been at United for, what, seven years, whatever it was, eight years, I couldn't see myself then going back to teacher training college and trying to pick up a few more qualifications. Now, when I did retire, I'd had three operations quickly in succession. And my leg was really, really skinny. It was weak. And after I retired, there was such a wave of sympathy towards me that I was invited to an awful lot of functions, you know, and people were very, very kind. And um, But at the same time, it was a little bit of a burden. And I, I spent literally three months, you know, attending an awful lot of functions on the back of being you know poor old Steve and I, I was still 28 so I was thinking well how on earth do I decide what to do with the rest of my life I didn't really have an inclination to be a, a manager or a coach at that stage but to recover from the surgeries and to get away from everything I then went to live in Amsterdam for three months as one does um and I was also getting physio treatment there. Um, to be absolutely honest, I met uh, a Dutch physiotherapist who was a friend of Arnold Muren. If you remember him, he used to play for Manchester United. Arnold introduced me to a Dutch physio who was ironically called Richard Smith. And Richard sort of examined my leg after I'd retired. And he then said to me, he said, listen, I I think I can get you back playing again. And I said to him, no, you know, that candle is gone. You know, I'm, I'm finished with that. Um, and he said, well, listen, let me try. Come over to Amsterdam. I'll look after, you know, your sort of day-to-day -day expenses. You come and live with me. You'll need to buy your own food and all that business. But come to Amsterdam, give me three months, and if, we get you back playing again. And bearing in mind, I knew I couldn't play in the UK, but I could play in Europe. He said, if we get back playing, you back playing again, then I will take 10% of your income for the rest of your career. So at that stage, I thought, well, that's not a bad sort of option. It'll give me a chance to get away from everything. It'll give me a chance to sort of rebuild as far as I could my leg and get some strength back into it. And I spent three months in Amsterdam, and my favourite day of the week was a Sunday when I would go into Dam Square, downtown Amsterdam, buy the English papers, sit in a coffee bar for two, three hours, reading about the football. So I obviously came to the conclusion that there was something within me that wanted to stay in the game. And obviously, being finished as a player, the options then were coach or manager. So I came back from Amsterdam. I wasn't strong enough to resume any kind of career. And I let it be known through the press that I was looking to stay in football in some capacity. Now, in terms of coaching badges, I had my A licence only. So... Um, in those days, it wasn't a requirement. You could be a coach or a manager without a qualification. I let it be known I wanted to be a, a coach or a manager. I was offered something uh, at Wigan, which was a little bit vague, so I never took it. And then I met Ron Nodes, the chairman of uh, Crystal Palace at the Football Writers' Dinner. He had just appointed Dave Bassett. And... Um, Within five days, Dave Bastard had left, and I just knew he was going to call me. So I went from not having a clue about what I was going to do with the rest of my life to Ron Nodes calling me up. And after one very brief meeting um, in South London, 
he offered me the job as manager. So from then onwards, you know, I was set on the idea of trying to be successful as a manager. My first year, I look back and say it was a nightmare. It was the blind leading the blind because I didn't have a clue. My players were looking to me for answers. I didn't have anyway, any answers. It was the steepest learning curve ever. But that steep learning curve um, did so much to give me the fundamentals of what management was about. And the bottom line from that, I would say, is being pragmatic. You can have the, the most brilliant principles in the world. And even now, I cringe when I hear it, a, a young manager say, we try and play football the right way. Because there is no right way. There is a way that makes the best of your situation. And in the art of survival, managers now, the average career expectancy of a manager is minimal, to say the least. But if you can survive those first couple of years, you've got a chance. So, you know, now I try and help a few young managers survive those couple of years. But it was never on my radar, radar to be a coach or a manager. If I hadn't have been injured, I would have played till I dropped and I would not even have thought about being a coach or a manager. And then um, I'm going to bring in Dylan and Johnny to take over after this. But one final question from me before I do that is, um, obviously, you then gain some really good experience as a manager. And I, I guess that sort of told you that that you could you could do this after that that first year that you've described there. When you when you came to Reading, how did that opportunity come about? And, and what was your what was your brief? Was it about getting up to the Premier League or was it about? you know, the long-term ambition, what what, uh, what were you given as a brief when you, you joined Reading? And firstly, how did that come about? Well, I would visited uh, Reading an awful lot when I was manager of Palace, going to Elm Park, the chairman. Uh, Sir John had been always very, very polite. I was quite intrigued by him as a sort of personality. Um, I, I looked more closely when Alan Pardew became manager. And myself and Alan Pardew uh, used to exchange videos quite often of teams we were going to play against. So I used to meet up with Alan uh, at a pub somewhere in between uh, where we lived and we'd exchange VHS, VHS videos on opposition teams. You know, there was none of this now where you clock into to, to some kind of uh, app where you can get every game under the sun whenever you want. You know, we literally travelled. We'd meet up, exchange VHS, VHS videos and, and have a beer somewhere. Um, so I was aware of what he was doing at Reading and he was talking about the new stadium and all this. So, you know, it, it was sort of on my radar, but without really being significant. Now, after I left Palace, I uh, managed Brentford, and then I was given the chance to manage Brighton. Um, now, when I took over at Brighton, they had four points from 11 games in the what is now the championship, I think it was. Yeah, the championship. And we eventually took that season right to the very last game. We were relegated, but we gave a, a real good go about trying to survive. Um, we missed out on that. We started the next season. And I think about after about 13, 14, 15 games, we were top of the table. And I was convinced we were going to get promotion. We weren't a great side, but we were very, very uh, workmanlike and we had a few goal scorers. And uh, then one day, um, Dick, who was the chairman of Brighton, uh, phoned me up and he said, uh, Sir John Majeski, oh, John Majeski at the time, sorry, not Sir John at that time. Uh, the chairman of Reading has been on the phone. He would like to speak to you about the vacancy he has at Reading. Alan Pardew had left, I think, to go to West Ham. So at the time, you know, I'm sitting pretty top of the table. I really enjoyed my time at Brighton. Um, I just thought it was a really nice club, friendly people. I enjoyed working there. 
And I said to Dick Knight, the chairman, I said, listen, uh, chairman, yeah, I'm enjoying my time here. Um, if you don't want me to speak to Reading, I'm quite happy. You know, just uh, I'm OK. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, I know how football works. You have to go and talk to them. I said, no, I don't have to go and talk to them. I'm feeling happy here. I think we're going to get promotion. The team's good. You know, when you got a winning team, it's sort of, it steadies your life. You know, it's 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 not uh, you know a real issue. So he said, "No, I insist you go and talk to 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 Reading." Now, at the time, I spoke with uh, Nick Hammond. When I did come to talk to Reading, it was to Nick Hammond, who'd just been made director of football. And I, I went along, to tell you the whole story as it happened, I went along with my agent, uh, a man called Athol Still. Now, I didn't use to use agents, but he got me the job at Brighton. So when Reading came in, I thought, well, I better take him along because, you know, he'll have a better idea of what people are earning than, than I will. So I took him along and Nick said to me, uh, what have you brought him for? I said, he's my agent. He says, oh, we, we don't talk with agents. So I said to him, well, you're telling me that, you know, all the deals you've done with players, you don't talk to agents. He said, oh, yeah, we talk with agents, with players, but not for managers and staff. I said to him, well, OK, then, Nick. I said, I don't negotiate. I said, so make me an offer. And I'll phone you up later on tonight and say yes or no. So he made me an offer. And to be absolutely honest, it was less than I was earning at Brighton. So he made me the offer. I shook hands with him. And I said, right, I'll phone you up later on tonight. And I phoned him up and said, sorry, Nick. Um, you know, I'm going to stay where I am. And he said, look, you know, we can talk about this. I said, no, I said, I told you, I don't negotiate. And I put the phone down, or we put the phone down. It wasn't, you know, nasty or anything. It was very amicable. I said, no, no, that's the way it goes, Nick. That's it. I'm happy where I am. So I phoned up the chairman of Brighton and uh, I said to him, oh, I'm not going to Reading. Thanks for alerting me about the situation. And I detected a very disappointed sound in his voice. <laughs> and it later transpired that he had already negotiated the compensation. So Brighton at the time didn't have any money. It was very much hand to mouth. So the compensation I know was very, very handy when it eventually happened. But it didn't happen for about four or five days. And then Ni Nigel Howe phoned me up and he said, oh, I think we got off on the wrong foot. And I said, well, I didn't. I said, you might have done, but I didn't. And he said, can we talk again? I said, well, can I bring my agents along? He said, yeah, bring your agents along. And then I agreed the deal to to come to Reading. So it was quite a, a drawn out process. And, uh, you know, me and Nick after that were great. I, you know, I like to think anyway, we were great for all the time I was at Reading. So it's all, all worked out well in the end. Yeah, and what about the brief, Steve? What was uh, what was that? Oh, it, well, when I when I eventually uh, met uh, uh, Mr. Majewski, as I was told to call him at that time, um, you know, he just said to me, "It's great to have you on board." He says, uh, "You know, I just want you to know that um, I'll take care of the business, and you'll be in charge of the football." And there was never any talk about what the ambition was. I know he was, he was ambitious, but it was never ever, there was never a list sort of presented. Number one, we got to get promotion. Number two, but it took me three years to get promotion. And those three years, my first year there, and I think I joined around about October or something like that. My first year, we finished ninth. My second year, we finished seventh. And I'd signed a three-year contract or a two-and-a-half-year, whatever it was, almost three years. And I just knew my third year of my contract, if we hadn't got promotion, then I'd have been gone. 
I knew that. It was just unwritten, but very much well understood. So uh, at the start of that third year, it, I knew everything was on the line and it was now or never. And thankfully, um, it all worked out well. But there was never, I, I was never ever sat down and said, listen, we've got to get promotion. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. It was very much Sir John was aware of, you know, football is a handicap competition. The haves and the have-nots and the people who are in between. And, and we were sort of in between with aspirations, great aspirations. And Sir John, you know, I asked him to buy Leroy Lita that summer. And I, I said, the goals are going to make the difference for us. And we, we bought Leroy and that gave us, you know, the the triumvirate up front, uh, two from th any of the three, Leroy, Kevin and, and Kitts, you know, two from three that you could not go wrong. And I think during the course of that season, I only had to make the choice two from three, I think on two occasions because of injuries and uh, just the way the season worked out. So I was put in a good position. I think it might have been a problem if all three of them had been th fit all season long. But because of injuries, they sort of dovetailed wonderfully well. And, you know, the huge surprise, very, very welcome surprise was Doyle because he came from nowhere and, you know, on the face of it, should have been the third pick, but more often than not, was like the engine room of that three. He was the one you sort of de depended on a little bit more than the other two. Now, he'd come to us in the middle of the Irish season, so he was super fit when we started that year. And obviously, that was a huge advantage, not only for him, but for us as a team. Yeah. And I'm going to bring Dylan in now, because Dylan, I don't think you were on the call in series one with Steve, were you? No, I wasn't. And like, you know, it's off, as you said earlier, I mean, I grew up watching Steve Coppel and Gordon Hill, you know, yeah. in, in, in the Stretford end for four or five years. And, you know, I, I've got two things, you know, one, you know, watching both him and Gordon, because I was left footed, uh, Gordon was left footed. Uh, Steve, you were right footed. I mean, as a young kid, you know, fortunate, fortunate enough to go as a, a youngster to watch the Leeds greats of Bremner, Giles, as a young kid that didn't understand it. But then, you know, coming into my 10s, 11s, 12s, 13s, going to watch it, man, going watching Man United um, and watching probably the best team and probably the best kit you ever played in was that white with the three black stripes yeah. down there. Man United kit ever. Um you know, it's absolutely an honour to be to be on here. But also, it's probably you'll not remember this, but Howard Wilkins and Harry Bassett got me a got me a training a trial a kind of trial at, at Palace. I think it was in 1995 uh, when I left Reading. You know, and I came down and you 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 allowed me to train for two weeks. I worked with Steve Kember. If he's still yeah. alive, I'd love. To I saw him. I saw him on Saturday. Oh, he, <laughs> he, he very was much brilliant. alive. He was brilliant with me, and Kevin Muscat came at the yeah. same time. So I was yeah. playing, and obviously he was a right back. But obviously, you got the legend Dean Gordon at left back. Yeah. You know, and I had I had two great weeks um, at Palace. I think I scored three goals as a left back um, against these non-league Isthmian League teams or whatever you call them in the yeah. pre-season. I got one at Leighton Orient as well, which you took, you actually took the game. You actually said, listen, you're playing today. Um, but I, I was still struggling. Like you said, I was, I was only 28 and I, I'd got this nasty injury that I'd recovered with. So I'd yeah. like to, and I never had the opportunity to thank you for giving me that two weeks. Yeah. Because from there, I went on to Kilmarnock and, and continued my career for four years. So not only did you, you know, inspire me to be, the winger that I was as a youngster, eventually going back to left back. But, you know, without, you know, watching the likes of you and Gordon, you know, and all the Manchester United legends, and having that two weeks opportunity to train at Palace with you, you yeah. know what I mean? I'm in South Africa now looking at 
one of my heroes of, of football, and I'd just like to say thank you for that. No, well, it's very kind of you to say. Oh, one, of my, one of my questions, well, two of my questions I was going to ask you. What was your favourite memory at United as a player? Um, what was Obviously, your injury would have probably been the worst episode. But also, you know, as a manager, you've said about being pragmatic, about, you know, the younger managers now saying, we want to play the right way, uh, which is 100%. What, what, what was your, you know, as a player and as a manager, what were your two great things that you you remember and that you'd like to be remembered for? Well, as a player at United, I'd, I would have to go back uh, to my first game. You know, I, um, as a young player for Tranmere, playing, I, I used to play for my um, uh, department, in the interdepartmental uh, football matches at Liverpool University. I was goalkeeper for Comic-Con, Commerce and Economics. And we used to play on a Wednesday. And while I was at Tramir, I would continue to play as a goalkeeper. <laughs> and because I, I felt, you know, I wanted to be well, with my cool. mates. I wanted to be with my mates. And yet, I'm, no camera phones, no real publicity then. I could get away with it, have a beer afterwards. It, Good time. And then when I got transferred, I thought, I shouldn't really keep this up, but I would do. And the week before I got transferred, I played in goal for Commerce and Economics in the Interdepartmental League. And then I got a phone call from the general manager at Tranmere on a Wednesday saying, you know, get your backside over here. Tommy Doherty's in my office. We've agreed to sell you. And you got to remember, I was 19, I think, at the time. Um, no agents, um, no advice. I'd always wanted to play for Liverpool, brought up as a, a scouser, watching Liverpool every week. No one to, to talk to, really, except my father. I phoned my dad up and I said, oh, dad, uh, uh, apparently they've agreed to sell me to Man United. You know, what do you think? And he said some pearls of wisdom. He said, listen, son, he said, you don't turn down Man United. <laughs> so I went over to talk to Tommy Doc. First thing he said to me, he says, I've never seen you play. But people whose opinions I respect say you're a good player and, you know, we're going to sign you. And that was a Wednesday. We agreed. Well, there was nothing to agree. I would have signed for nothing. Uh I eventually signed for £60 a week, which, again, as a student, was an enormous amount of money. And then he said to me, you'll be sub on Saturday. So this was Wednesday when we had the conversation. I had tutorials and lectures on Thursday and Friday, so I couldn't train with the team. And he just said to me, he said... Um, get yourself to Old Trafford Cricket Club, 12 o'clock on Saturday. I didn't have a clue where Old Trafford Cricket Club was. <laughs> and eventually I'd, I found out, got the map, my old shaky car got me there. And Saturday at 12 o'clock, I was introduced to the people I'd only ever seen on the television before. Legends, Lou McCary, you know, Stuart Pearson, Martin Buchan, Alex Stepney. You know, absolute legends for me. And I was so nervous. And uh, ironically, on the day as well, um, Tranmere were playing at Aldershot and they'd spent the week preparing for that game at the army camp in Aldershot. So my boots were with Tranmere Rovers. So I had no boots for the game. So again, I'm turning up. I don't know anyone. I've got no boots. You know, the other players must have thought, what is going on here? What have they signed? I eventually um, wore a, an old pair of Stuart Pearsons. Uh, United were playing Cardiff on the day. They were stumbling a little bit in that uh, campaign where they got relegated the season before and then bounced straight back up. And they were stumbling a little bit when I signed. And after an hour against Cardiff, very frustrating, couldn't score. 
didn't really look that promising, to be honest. And then the doc said to me, you're coming on. So he was taking Willie Morgan off. Willie Morgan was a big favourite, but Doc had fallen out with him for whatever reason. So when the sign went up for Willie to come off, the crowd started booing. And I was on the sideline. I'm thinking, oh, they're not booing me. You know, I've done nothing yet. <laughs> what are you going on about? And when I came on, we had a corner. And I literally sprinted on. My heart was jumping out my chest. I couldn't believe I was going from students in Liverpool, playing a tram there, a couple of thousand people, 60-odd thousand at Old Trafford. I couldn't believe it. And I sprinted onto the pitch, and I just about made the edge of the box when the corner came in. And Stuart Houston rose above everyone else, smashed the header in the corner of the net. 1-0. And I thought, oh, this is just incredible. Fairy tale times 10. You know, only just come on, we're 1-0 up. And that obviously relaxed everybody. Um, they started playing a lot better. The first time I got it, I just panicked. I'd, I'd be the first to admit it. Got the ball out my feet, crossed it into the box blindly. Wasn't picking anyone out, just putting it in there. And Stuart Pearson scored a header from the cross. 2-0 up, and I'd been a part of it. We eventually won the game 4-0, and it, it was beyond a fairy tale for me. And, you know, from then onwards, it was just, you know, nine years, apart from the injury, of just the most sensational thing. So that was, without doubt, I would say, the finest moment. And the worst moment, as you said, would be the injury. We were playing against Holland, uh, not Holland, rather, Hungary, in a... Uh, a vital World Cup qualifier. We needed to win the game to get to the World Cup in Spain, 82. Uh, we went 1-0 up. We were in control of the game, really. I took on the full back once, and it was a bad challenge. And I went down. As soon as I went down, I always say it felt as if a firework went off in my knee. And I sort of crawled to the edge of the pitch. Um, a sub came on. You know, ironically, <laughs> I drove back home that night um, and I, because I'd never been injured before, I didn't really know what to expect, but I just knew something wasn't right. And eventually, um, probably 18 months later, and having played in the World Cup, which was probably part of my undoing, I was desperate to play in the World Cup. I got injured in the November, I think it was, the World Cup, obviously the next June. I played for seven months with, with no ACL and a torn cartilage. And the, the damage that obviously did to my knee is, um, you know, had its immediate effect. And I had to retire probably a year after the World Cup. So the, the high, just getting on at Old Trafford, you know, it was just so, so memorable and beyond the dream come true. And the low was the injury. Well, mine. I, I, I'll, when I was when I signed as an apprentice at Sheffield Wednesday, my first uh, game was against Chesterfield, and that's when I signed. They got they offered me a, an apprenticeship, but my first uh, taste of playing was at Old Trafford against Man United, and Remy Moses and Lou Macari. Well, I was playing centre midfield against Remy Moses and Lou Macari, two absolute yeah. legends. United. I remember at Old Trafford when they had a cup game, the, the fans used to turn up to get the tokens. So you'd have, yeah, a, right, you'd have but... fans watching a reserve game. And yeah. I remember I absolutely topped Lou Macari with a great 50-50 and I went straight through him. And I absolutely bricked it because he come up to me and I'm, I'm on the floor. He gets up all Scottish and angry. And he went, wee man, great tackle, brilliant tackle. And I, <laughs> Oh, thanks, thanks. <laughs> These guys were my heroes. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I can remember Paddy Roach, uh, Alex Stepney, he got, um, you know, the Greenoff, you got Greenoff, you got uh, Pearson, you got Jimmy Greenoff, you got Gordon McQueen used to come out 20 minutes before you lot did for the warm-up. Martin Buchan, legend. You got, yeah. you know, you got on the wings and you, you got big Joe John when he came. I mean, that that team for me, 
You know, I hated it when they sacked Tommy Doherty. I hated it when they got rid of Dave Sexton. You know, it, it, it was like part of my life. And to, 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 to as a 16 year old, to play at Old Trafford against your yeah. heroes was you know, it's like you, when you, you, you signed yeah. when you walked in, you know, like, wow, look at all these players. So it, it's, right. it's amazing. It is. It's a it's a wonderful theatre. It's a bit misshapen now when you look at it, and you know, along with a lot of United people, I'm very much aware that it needs work on it now. It's uh, it needs to be restored to its former status as being the best stadium around. It was always carried more people, obviously, but it had a symmetry to it which it doesn't have now, and. I hope whoever takes over does something about that and makes it very, very special again. But, you know, the, the, the actual place to play. And again, the, the personalities you mentioned, you know, you mentioned mm -hmm. Lou. Lou was just incredible. Like Remy, off the field, never, ever said a word. And yet on the field, he was one of the most talkative players ever. He was such a, a winner, desperate to win. Um, you know, always he always got the feeling with Remy he had a point to prove. You know, he he had to prove to people that he was right up with the with the top players, and you know he did that week in week out. And you know, Gordon McQueen, Joe Jordan, when they came, Gordon McQueen still one of the funniest people I've I've ever known in football. He's just non-stop. He's uh, uh, terrific. He's poorly now. Apparently, I I haven't seen him for a long time. He's 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 got uh, dementia. He's got a few issues, I think. But you know, I have so many just happy, happy memories of the whole environment. It was a happy club, and that came from Doc. You know, I, I, Doc started something that that second division year. He started the style of play, you know, small players who were quick, fast, everything was done. It had to be quick. You know, I look at some of the football now where they pass across the back four about eight times and it goes nowhere. And I know yeah. football's different now, but like Tommy Doherty would just be, you know, let's 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 play. Let's let's look to be positive all the time. Let's play. Let's get, you know, the Manchester United to play and get the ball out wide down the flanks, get crosses in. Uh, you know, I think that was established by some Matt back in the day, always having width in the team. And it's great now when you see Ratchford, you know, whatever combination they have up front. Uh, I love it when Bruno plays out wide now. I think he just gives a guile and a wisdom out wide. His passing ability is great. You know, that spread of the attack is what United have always been about. And uh, it's great to see it so sort of returning, obviously, in a different guise now, the way teams play and a different tempo. But when they counterattack, the speed of it now is a, just a delight to me. And I'm sure if the doc was still around, he'd be loving it. Yeah, Steve, uh, Do you I, think... just to, I just want to um, bring Dylan. Right. I'll go on, Dylan, go on, and then I'll, I'll, I've got... Sorry. And this is my last I'll finish off your question, Dylan, actually, about the manager part, highlight of um, Steve's career as a manager. Oh, um, well, I, I think the, the one individual game, I always say, but my season at Reading, when we got promotion, was a season sent from heaven. I always say that because, you know, I got the teaser of the first game when we got beat. And um, then we went 45 games with one more defeat. And that was a fabulous match against Luton away. Um, you know, that was a season sent from heaven. But if there was one game that I would have to look back on, I would say it's the Palace game, the semi-final against Liverpool, when we won 4-3 to get to Wembley to play against Man United in the final 1990. You know, that season, you have to remember as manager of Palace, the first time I'd taken a team to Anfield, my boy, boyhood club. Uh, we got beat 9-0. And, uh, you know, that was probably the most humbling experience I've ever had as a manager. Although, looking back, it was the catalyst for change. Because after that, Ron Nodes... Um, we we made some very astute buys, including the first million pound goalkeeper Nigel Martin, 
Uh, later on that season, having been beaten 9 0, we brought some new players in and we climbed up the league and we were doing all right. And then we played Liverpool at home and we got beat 2 0 at home. And I made the schoolboy error as a manager. Um, one of my players was injured at the time when I was uh, just about to make a substitution. And I saw my player sort of roll around and I said to my physio, he's all right, forget about him. Let's make the substitution. Physio ran on, I'd made the substitution and then the next minute I get the sign from the physio, he's not all right, going to have to drag <laughs> him off. So we played against Liverpool for the last 20 odd minutes with 10 men and it was all my fault. We got beat 2-0. So that season when we played Liverpool, uh, in that semi-final, uh, we'd been beaten 11-0 in the previous two games on aggreg aggregates. And then we played them in the semi-final at uh, Villa Park. And it, it still remains to me, you know, one of the best games that there's been in the FA Cup. It was just sensational. And for us to go on and win that game and then get to the final... You know, that was the most emotional game I think I've ever been involved in. You know, with uh, Reading in our season from heaven, it was relentless. From the second game onwards, it was just... There was, looking back now, it was almost inevitable that we were going to do what we did because we were just a hungry club. The players were hungry. None of them had ever played, played in the Premiership before. The club was hungry. So many people wanted to see Reading in the, the top flight. And there was, as I say, just inevitable that it was going to happen. But the one-off game was the Palace v uh, Liverpool. Yeah, Johnny, you've been waiting very patiently, so I'll bring you in. And obviously, oh, then Dylan, I, know Dylan, I know Dylan wants to come back in, but... Johnny, over to you now. I know it's always a pleasure to listen to you, Steve. Lovely to see you again. Cheers. That, that I mean, well, there's two things I'm going to ask you. You had pards as you as a player, and then you had him against you as a manager. Was that weird? <laughs> or did you uh, recognise no. him as a future manager? Well, well, you've got to remember that I think I signed Alan Pardew when he was 26. I'm sure I'd signed him from Yeovil, non-league. I'd seen him play before, I think when he was playing for Dulwich maybe, or yeah. one of the, the more local sides. And then he went to Yeovil and, uh, you know, we needed somebody else in midfield at the time. And we very much liked at the time the non-league mentality. Again, that, you know, you... You hire the attitude. You teach the skill and you hire the attitude. And so many non-league players that had signed at Palace had brought, delivered a great, hungry attitude. That Ian Wright fellow did a right for you, didn't he? Who? Ian Wright. Oh, Ian Wright. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he wasn't bad. Well, we, ha we had to go non-league. We had Black Andy Gray. We had Tony Finnegan. We had, uh, a lot of our team had, had those sort of non-league roots, you know, that real hunger, you know, yeah. there's hunger and there's hunger, you know, if you're not successful, you're going back to doing your day job, as it were, and it, it makes a significant difference. And Alan, I think, when I signed him, was a, a glazier. So, you know, I'd already signed a plumber and an electrician, I just need a glazier <laughs> to finish a few things off. Uh, but he came in and, again, Straight away, because he was 26, he was more mature. And you could tell he was so sort of cute in the dressing room. And even then, when I signed him, he was running a Sunday team. And you could tell he had a little bit more about him in terms of, you know, just presence. You know, he'd lived a little bit. A lot, so many football people are being cocooned in that environment. They do nothing, you know, yeah. other than football and as you know, in the football environment, everything is done for you. Where Alan's, Alan had been out and about, he knew what life was like, he knew what the price of failure was. So, you know, when he came in, we had a couple of trips reasonably quickly. And 
very quickly, I appointed him what I call social secretary. When the players were going out, you know, I'd say to him, you know, organize something or he would just organize something. And I'd say, you know, make sure they're all right. And I knew I could sort of trust him. So I, I knew from day one that he had a real desire to be coach, manager, whatever. So when he, when he went to Reading as a coach and then graduated to manager, I wasn't surprised. Whereas, like, to a certain extent, Gareth Southgate, now terrific <laughs> manager of England, when I signed him as a boy and he, him coming through at Crystal Palace, you know, I'm really quite surprised that he's turned out to be, you know, first and foremost coach manager, I thought. <laughs> to be honest, I thought he was too intelligent for it. <laughs> but... You know, he's magnificent now. He is the perfect fit. Square peg, square hole. He's a perfect fit. Um, but Alan Pardew, I knew from day one that he would be a coach manager. Uh, we locked horns a few times when I was manager of Brentford and uh, he was at yeah. Reading. And obviously the promotion, when he got promotion, when he robbed us. He got promotion. <laughs> but again, it's amazing the way things worked out. That turned out a few years later to my advantage yeah did you um nowadays i was speaking to dylan about it do you think football now has got too many backroom people you know like when you you when you were manager at reading you had your assistant and uh we had a structure at reading was this this and this yeah you, you were in charge now yeah. it seems you've got all these analysts da, 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 da. what what do you think well, I, you know, as we were saying about the VHS transfers, um, <laughs> I've always been super supportive of analysis. You know, I think I was probably one of the first coaches, managers to edit my own tapes of oppositions. We were due to play and I always did that. I'm very, very super keen on that. Um my first away trip, if I can explain it best probably with you, my first away trip as manager was, I think, at Crystal Palace going to Carlisle. It was obviously a trip. We had to go overnight. You know, yeah. money was really tight when I started. And we, if we could avoid an overnight, we would do. But Carlisle, we just had to. Now, on that first overnight trip that I did, there was 12 players. There was only one sub. We couldn't afford to take an extra player if anyone became ill, then that was just it. So we had we had 12 players. There was myself, there was my assistant manager, Ian Evans. Our physio was part-time. So he was meeting us up there. He was driving up there himself. So on a Friday afternoon when we left to go to Carlisle, he wasn't on the bus. Um my kit man was also the groundsman at the training ground. So on a Friday afternoon after we'd finished training, we had to wait for him to white line the pitch for the youth team the next morning. So literally, we're on the bus waiting for him to finish white line in the pitch for the youth team to play there the next morning. So we had 14 on the bus and that was it. Yeah. And now... Whenever I go to a premiership game, when you see the opposition arrive, there is already a bus there because the staff, the ancillary staff, the sports scientists, the analysts, every Uncle Tom, everyone is is in the other bus. You know, I, I hear that certain teams will take 20 odd staff with them to away games. Wow. So you ask me the question, is it too many? I would say on a match day, yes. You know, I much preferred that sort of in, intimate atmosphere. Um, you know, when you think of what, there'll be 19, 20 players now minimum, I would imagine, plus all the people round about. You know, it, it's very hard to sort of create that intense yeah. team atmosphere when it, it's so big. Yeah. And that has always been, I always said that when we started getting bigger squads at Reading, that, 
you know, the hardest thing is to keep the five or six who know they've got no chance of playing, keeping yeah. them happy. Or not happy is the wrong word, but keeping, keeping them, involved. them involved. Yeah. Um, because if they're not happy, they're not involved, then they're bad apples and yeah. they, they're creating issues. And, you know, I look at some of the clubs now and the size of the squads they have and, you know, how they train them all on a daily basis. It just it creates mountains and yeah. um you know it, it obviously not the same everything develops and and but sometimes not always for the best yeah well last thing if i pass back to the lads oh, just God. one thing you've got a reading godfather of management here you steve we've got dylan who's trying to get his way into management in the uk what advice would you give him well it's a funny one it's a funny one with management because I always say the art of management is picking the right club. And obviously you don't have control of that. You don't have the choice of just being able to pick a right club. But sometimes clubs are offered to you. And, and certainly in English football now of the four leagues, I always say of the 90 odd clubs, there's 70 clubs you don't want to manage because you've got no chance. Because it is each league is a handicap. You know, that I always say success in football is easy. If you've got the most money, you buy the best players, then you should have the best team. If you haven't got money, if you haven't got options, if you haven't got choices, then it's very, very hard to make and create a career because you're not making managerial choices yourself. The bank manager is. Yeah. Or the tax man is, or somebody other than you. So you can't pick and choose. You've just got to grab an opportunity when you can. But, you know, there, there, there are a lot of places that you just know you're marking time and you've got to go in there, smash and grab and get out as quickly as you can because inevitably you'll be dragged down. Now, you're probably better off being part of a bigger organisation than fronting up a small organization who are, um, you know, just so financially challenged that it's a patchwork quilt. You're forever making uh, polyfiller decisions just to fill holes rather than trying to create something. You know, it, it's a great challenge. It's a magnificent challenge. Um, and I wish you the best of luck. Um, <laughs> but it's tough. You know it's going to be tough. If it was easy, everyone was going to be doing it. It's tough. You've got to have qualities that shine through in the darkest room. You've got to have, you know, a voice, a mentality, a vision. The vision being the biggest thing. You've got to have a vision about what you want to do, how you want your teams to play. And you've got to have the ability to implement it in some way small capacity on a week-to-week -week basis so that it just grows tier after tier after tier and gets better. And people see, you know, the light that you've been shining at in the dark room, you know, just comes out and is on display to everybody after a while. Dylan, do you, do you want to ask um, one more question to Steve about his time yep. at Reading? And then, I, and then I've got, got something because we've, we've no, taken no, a lot no, of his time already, but off, uh, over to you. No, I mean, this is, look, Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm in South Africa right now, and obviously we're talking about Man United, uh, about their attacking fluidity, blah, 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 um, with uh, how they, 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 they've got back to the old old ways. From a South African point of view, and this will be good for, for the Ready podcast, Benny McCarthy, you know, is, is the yeah. striker. Uh, have you got any comments from, you know, from a, from a former winger that as Bunny, you know, I don't think a lot of South Africans know what he actually has brought to Rashford's game, to the to, to Man United since he's arrived. Have you got any anything so our South African listeners can can to, can tune into this part? Uh yeah, the, the, there's there's been a number of articles in England about his uh, impact and his presence. Now the one thing I would say about Marcus Rashford Rashford is that he was waiting to happen. He was wanting to happen. I think he's known over the last couple of years with the circumstances at Old Trafford that 
he perhaps hadn't delivered his best. And, um, you know, last summer, I think he went to America under his own uh, steam just to get himself super fit before the season. He was on a mission. And I think he came back from America the best prepared he's ever been to start a season. And then lo and behold, you know, he's given guidance and wisdom from a terrific player. And just the union of the, the two, I think, has brought out the very best. But again, it, it's all down to Marcus's attitude, I think, in the first place. And then the environment created by Benny that just means he can flower. He can just really show the world what he's capable of. Not only his physicality, but his ability to be able to score and create what seems at the moment, when he is in full flow, almost a will. And again, it's, it's, he's been hothoused this year. He's been given knowledge that perhaps has been de deprived to him in the past with all the different coaches. You know, I'm a great believer, you know, again, when I was at Palace, I think I was one of the first coaches. I had a defensive coach. I didn't have an attacking coach because I used to like working with forwards. And, uh, you know, I, I think specific coaches were always going to be the way. And when you get that, that blend where you see two people who are obviously uh, simpatico on the same wavelength, and again, that vision, you know, Marcus can see the vision. He can see how, um, you know, Benny's obviously seen him and knows what the best circumstances to bring out the best in him. So, you know, the, the South African influence, which is a, a rich one at Old Trafford, obviously with Gary Bailey, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's uh, paying dividends here and long may it do so because, you know, for me, there is a responsibility for the top teams to attack. You know, it, it's not just about counter-attack. It's not just about soak up pressure and maybe win a set piece to win games. You know, I think the best teams, you know, the real worldwide teams, they have a responsibility to attack, attack in style, attack in a sustained way consistently. And I, I'm glad to see that Manchester United are accepting that mantle and really going forward in that way now. Steve, just bringing it back to um, Reading now, obviously a big success for you at Reading was your recruitment and, and bringing players through with, you, you mentioned Kevin Doyle and you, you think of players like Leroy Lisa, who you mentioned, Dave Kitson, bringing players through, not, not necessarily just with potential, but you could see them fitting in as the type of player that, that would fit into that, that jigsaw. Um, how, how did you actually put all that together and, and turn that into a successful team? Well, I, I'd been left a, a terrific core from Alan Pardew. You know, you, you think Marcus, the goalkeeper, you know, sensational. You know, I still maintain in my time at Reading, you you can count on the fingers of one hand of the no, not even that many mistakes. He hardly made a mistake. He was always there. He was a great mentality. You know, the two fullbacks I inherited, just fabulous. Um Harper, who I think was just waiting to happen when I got there. Uh, he was fabulous. Sidwell, who I took with me to Brentford and Brighton. You know, Alan, you know, probably saw what I saw in, in Stephen Sidwell. Um, Glenn Little was obviously an acquisition I knew from my days at Palace. He was terrific. Less left side, you know, Stephen Hunt, Bobby. Um, to a one terrific season, obviously, but Hunty for the rest of the time. And then my my thing has always been about scoring. You need to score goals. And I think in any successful team, you need playing in a sort of 4-4-2 formation. Obviously, 
a little bit different now with the different formations that people use. Uh, I played a 4-4-2, 4-4-1-1. You know, your two fellas at the top of the pitch, I was convinced, had to score you. And they could be different people, didn't have to be the same people. I was convinced they had to score 40 goals between them. And, you know, that was almost always my quest to get the goal scorers and then fill in behind. So once we've got, you know, Kitson from Cambridge, Doyle was the gift and Leroy we designed. Um, then we had to provide. We provided. Glenn Little was sensational for a couple of years. Stephen Hunt and Bobby, obviously, midfield were just so athletic. And then we sort of made our, our back line with the two centre-backs with Ivar and Sonko. So it, it was a vision that, you know, we, we were building towards. It took three years to get there or two years to get there. But it was very much a design rather than an accident. We knew what we wanted. And it, it wasn't just my vision. You know, Brian McDermott was was fabulous looking for the players. He knew exactly what we were looking for. And he went out and found people. So it was a, a two-year plan and uh, it came to fruition. It does not often happen in football, but again, just to emphasise the season sent from heaven, uh, it was uh, beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah, Johnny, going to bring you back in for, for one more question. No, I have to ask this, Steve. I asked this last time and you said somebody at golf day thought you were dead. Do you remember that conversation? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, your mate, your best mate, Neil Warnock's back in football again. So, I have to ask, are you, are you thinking of taking up a job again? Well, it, obviously, from my uh, sort of Crystal Palace connections, I've had so many people asking me before Roy was appointed about whether I would be interested in going back there and uh, my answer to them was that I was too young. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Roy going back in at 75, uh, Neil going back in at whatever age he professes to be. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wouldn't go back into English football. You know, my last three years were coaching in India. Yeah. I, As an experience of life, I would love to do something like that again. You know, I... The wheel turns. I always think, you know, it's wrong for old coaches to outstay the welcome. I could do. I know if I really pushed, you know, people, yeah. um, I could probably nick a job somewhere. But Where would you like wheel... to go? Where would you, uh, have you got a, a, like the A-League or somewhere that, something, somewhere you see something different to yourself? Uh, no, I, I, you know, somewhere, I don't know, like Finland or, you know, somewhere a little bit really off the beaten track, yeah. obscure, just to, to what I look, even now I go to a lot of non-league games and I love what happens at non-league. You know, you, you turn up like 10 to 3 or whatever and there's somebody on the turnstiles who's given the time for free. You walk into the ground, someone's being the groundsman, cut the grass for free. Yeah. You have a cup of tea in the little hut by the side of the pitch. And there's a couple of ladies in there doing work, making chips, sandwiches, whatever, burgers for free. And it's that sort of community that I really enjoy in a football club. And it's, you know, the, the, the places where I've been successful, I've felt we've had that community spirit yeah. You know, it's not just been about a wage packet. It's been a little bit more. And, you know, as I, I used to say to my players, do more than you paid for and one day you'll get paid more than you're worth. And I think that is so, so important yeah. in a football environment. And I hate to say it, it's becoming r rarer because of the mercenary value. You know, so many people, People, you know, kiss the badge of one team one week and then kiss the badge of another team two weeks later. And, yeah. you know, I think supporters see through that. But they would love, each and every uh, supporter would love to see the players have that same feel that they have for their club. You know, and it is rare. I think at Reading, we had it for a, 
because everyone was just so hungry to succeed. Was it for Reading? Yeah. Was it the prime reason? Probably not. There was the obviously individual success, which was the prime reason, but it was a, a very close second. We 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 had a unique feel about the place, and it, it all came down from the chairman. Yeah. You know, I, I always say that now about a football club, the chairman sets the atmosphere. You know, you think, well, how on earth can a chairman affect, you know, a young apprentice in the academy or whatever? And they shouldn't, but they do. There is something about the atmosphere that falls down from the very top that either means a lot to people or it doesn't. And when it does mean a lot to the staff, to the players, to everybody connected with the club, then you've got a very, very special uh, something happening and it can only end in success. Steve, on, on that note, um, before we let you go, can I just ask you about the current situation at, at Reading, obviously, is a, a result and a consequence of, you know, what, what happened in the interim years after um, John Madeski, uh and, and you were at the club. Um, obviously, the club's had its difficulties and they're paying the the price for that now. Where where do you see Reading moving forward from from this point? Because they're they're in they're, they've been in kind of firefighting mode. But w- where do you see the future for for Reading going from here? Well, I don't know enough about it to be honest, Mark. Because you know, I, I I'm aware obviously, and I, I I read and I hear. Do I know exactly what's going on? No. And in a way, I've deliberately sort of distanced myself a little bit because, you know, for me, you know, I have this, you know, wonderful feeling about Reading. I really do. Um, and, you know, obviously there is still that connection. But I look at the club now and it's not the club that I was a part of. You know, it's, it is totally different. Uh, when I've been back, I see a lot of the old faces. Um, but in terms of direction and way out of this mess, I haven't got a clue. I can all I can do is is just, you know, wish that there can be a return to the values and the credibility that it once had, because I think people now look upon Reading as being, you know, a little bit of a misfit outfit. Um. It doesn't have the respect that it did have. And yet at the same time, you realise how difficult it is for the people within the club to try and produce, you know, a, a successful team. And I understand those difficulties. I don't understand the whole situation. I don't understand how it got to where it is. Um, the implications going forward you know, I, I I just keep my fingers crossed that everything turns out right in the end, as it were. The Stockdale paradox, what we used to talk about all the time, uh, our team, if you don't know what it is, look it up, but everything will turn out all right in the end. It's just basically the bottom line. And also, fingers crossed that Burnley drop a few points, eh? <laughs> well, you know, it's... <laughs> I have a drink every year when... The, the chasing teams can't reach our total, but I'm afraid this year the drink's getting later and later. I've usually <laughs> had it by now. I've usually had a few pints in by now, but uh, for this year, I, I I think that it's going to be close. Yeah, I can only I can only hope that they might get bored before the end and play a few youngsters just to give them the right number of games, but. You know, if it's broken, it's there to be broken. Obviously, it's a target. But as I say, we, we didn't have the uh, parachute payments to help us out. So in, a, in our particular league, we're still by far and away the champions. Absolutely. Well, Steve, what, whatever happens, um, that memory is, is never going to go for, for Reading fans of, of what Reading achieved, what you achieved for Reading. So um, just want to thank you ever so much for coming back on the 1871 podcast again been an absolute pleasure to to speak to you again cheers pal thank really you. appreciate it thank you very much whenever you want you know that just give us a call yeah cheers, appreciate Steve. it and our next uh episode is on friday evening with former royal bob leonard Utsi, the first canadian to play for redding so we're looking forward to speaking to him 
And that avail- uh, that episode is available anytime from 6 p.m. on Friday. And talking of 6 p.m., you might have heard me mention something about um, the, the time for, for the last episode. And we're not quite sure if Steve Koppel is going to be able to make it. That was my fault. I hold my hand <laughs> up. That was, that was me. I said a different time to Steve than I said to Johnny and Dylan. So that was my fault. Nothing to do with Steve. So um, there you go. <laughs> We make it up as we go along, but it's been a, a massive pleasure to to have you on as a, a guest, Steve. Thank you very much. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Night, all. Cheers, Steve. Lovely to see you again. Take care, mate. See you Thank you, Steve. Time. I really Cheers. enjoyed that as usual. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Bye.